Welcome to what's new in department two, part two. I heard that more than 450 people signed up for tonight, not tonight's, I'm sorry, I just woke up, um, today's <laughs> webinar. Um, we are really excited to have Judge Kelman back, and this is the effort, continued efforts from the leadership of the bar and the support, uh, leadership of the bench and support of the bar associations to keep everybody abreast of what's going on um, so we can do what our best efforts for our clients and the litigants. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping announcements. We will re you will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that is included with your certificate. This program will be available in a couple of days in BHBA On Demand, BHBA's newest member benefit presented by Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company. The family law section of BHBA is sponsored by White Zuckerman, Orsovsky, Luna, Hunt, LLP, and Our Family Wizard. White Zuckerman, Orsovsky, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that supports divorced and separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. And I have also the announcement from our um, sections interview series, direct examination with Dan and Lauren. We had so much fun as guests and we're excited for the rest of this year's lineup. August 3rd, Tony Storm and Tiglin Palunian. September 7th, Lisa Meyer. October 6th, Neil Hirsch. November 2nd, Melanie Mandels. December 7th, Judge Susan Lopez Gids. Each episode is live on Zoom at 12.30 p.m. and sign-up links are available on the BHBA calendar. And part three of today's series will most likely happen in September. So keep an eye out for the announcements and e-blasts. And now I, and we um, activated the chat. So if you have really good questions, you can post them on chat, but you're not sure if this is a really good qu question, then maybe wait until September and just email it to us. Um, the, the questions may not have, we may not have time to answer each question posted but we will try to circle back to you with the answers as best as we can. So now I hand it over to you, Judge Pellman. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is our second What's New in Two. I'm very proud of this program. It's been a pleasure to work together with the LA County Bar Association, as well as uh, the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Um, and to work with a diverse group of lawyers um, who are moderating it. So I think they're gonna introduce themselves, not that most of them need introductions. Um, Alex, you wanna go first? Sure, um, Alexandra, can you hear me? Yep. It's hard for me to hear myself. Uh, I'm Alexandra Leichter. I think I'm the oldest one of this group I'm going to um, ask Judge Pellman all the things that we used to do that we're not doing anymore, and which makes me crazy, of course. And how long have you been in practice? This is my 50th year. I know I look so young. You do. <laughs> uh, Patrick? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Patrick DeCarroll as DeCarroll's Family Law Group. Certified specialist, fellow AAML, uh, etc. I've been practicing for uh, a mere 43 years and uh, happy to be here. Kendra? Hello, everyone. My name is Kendra Thomas. 
I am serving along with Gina as the section's um, co-chair for probably about another month or so. I'm also the founder of Thomas Law Offices. We do all things family law, and we also do minors council work. And I am thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get going. Okay, well, I will kick this off. Your Honor, what is the court doing to free up judicial officer time for hearings and trials? Um, that's a really good question. Um, the numbers are, the, the numbers of filings are trending up uh, since we were last year in February. The good news is the number of dispositions are also trending up. So we are uh, taking care of cases. COVID continues to be our wild card. So as many of you know, um, in the last couple of years, uh, the main difference that we're really suffering uh, from is the complexity and length of restraining order hearings. That has really been a game changer. Um, and as I often say, the good news is that the domestic violence uh, statute has been expanded. And the bad news is that the domestic violence statute has been expanded, um, <laughs> tongue in cheek. Um, <clears throat> the uh, civil harassments are also um, taking up time. That's particularly true in the districts, especially when there are there is no restraining dedicated restraining order court. Um, you know, these cases are hard, those cases are hard to prove. Um, they have a clear and convincing standard, but they are, they're easy to file. And if uh, any violence is alleged, they're free to file. Um, they're not legally complex, but they're time consuming and they're complicated because they have to show violence, threat of violence, harassing course of conduct, and the result is really an uneven allotment of time compared to the relatively straightforward legal issues. Um, I have painstakingly discussed this with court leadership um, from the very day I started as supervising judge that I would very much like to uh, reshare the love of the civil harassments and send them elsewhere or at least share them. Um, <clears throat> uh, and also that when we're looking at numbers, you can't always look at the numbers anymore. You know, you have to take into consideration the quality and quantity of and time that the hearings take place. Um, so those are those are the issues. What are we doing about it right now? Um, I have, uh, since I started, we've reinstated all the DSO programs all over the county. Um, we have completely revamped the restraining order, not the restraining order, the um, temporary judge program. Um, we just uh, had a new training and we're uh, excited that uh, at this point, if you become a JPT and you qualify, then you can not just sit in a restraining order court, you can sit in a regular home court as well. Um, so that's very new than what we've had in the last number of years. I'm hoping that'll ease some pain. Now, does that mean that there's gonna be a JPT sitting every time a court is dark? No, um, administration makes, has made very clear that they, they need a break too. Um, so you'll see JPTs when there's unexpected absences, long-term absences, um, or in restraining order courts. Um, what else? Uh, I, I've also, we've also worked hard to restart uh, the civil harassment mediation program. Um, <clears throat> that's still ramping up in some places because Frankly, they lost a lot of volunteers and they're still looking for volunteers. Um, the, other, the other thing that you should be aware of if you do any civil harassments is uh, people tend not to wanna to go to mediation. They wanna have their day in court. So uh, we can't force them, but we're doing the best we can. 
Um, in addition, what will also help um, to give you more, to give more court time, the Judgment Assistance Day program has been highly successful. And um, um, we have worked really hard to try to figure out how we can do e-filing for these judgment for these judgments since they're self-represented litigants and um, we're now we've now figured out a way to do it we're excited and so we're hoping to expand it countywide and also start using it more in our settlement courts so volunteer So your honor, a couple of follow up questions, because you just gave us some really great information. Um, you mentioned the numbers going up in and that included numbers and overwhelm maybe in the branch and district courts. Does this affect when a case should be sent to long cause what's being deemed long cause. How are we handling the long cause courtrooms right now. Uh, that's that's a good question. Um, and it's a question that I've been looking at since I started. What I've what I've realized is that because of COVID, because of changes in leadership, um, how we've handled um, when a case should be come down to department two, when a case is deemed long cause has changed. And um, nobody really knows <laughs> what the story is. Um, so that's about, so I've been looking at that. It's about to change. Um, uh, Judge Kaufman and I have developed a protocol um, that I can't share with you until I share with the judges, which will be really soon. They know it's coming. Um, and it's gonna be very straightforward and everybody will know. Um, you know, people are asking, is long cause a thing of the past? It's not a thing of the past, but I will tell you, for example, that we lost Judge Iwasaki and at mosque. And because we, the county had a, um, had funding for two new commissioners, we had to find room for them. We still only have one courtroom, which right now is department 23. Um, so we lost that long cause. So the real estate at mosque is what's really difficult because, um, you know, and we've tried to work around it. We've created more long cause settlement in Santa Monica. We've also created the, um, uh, this kind of hybrid model for, it was first in Van Nuys and now we're doing it in, um, it was uh, in Santa Monica with Judge David Swift. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Hopefully that answers your question. It really Can I does. I just interrupt for one second? Go for it. <clears throat> that are you intending to have um, more of the uh, home courts do long causes and it'll be a matter of they can do cases that are three days or four days and set it over a period of time like we used to have in the old days? Uh, it's more, it's definitely more of that model. Okay. Yes, I think, um, and I guess I can just speak to that, which is, um, I want to give my judges, I guess they're not my judges, but the judges in the family law division, I want to give them support. And um, so I've, my view is that um, understanding case management and um, really learning about case management um, from each other is really important. And so I, uh, along with two of our long cause judges, um, they really developed um, a wonderful uh, program for case management, which was sort of the basic training. Um, every single bench officer in, um, uh, 
in, fa in the family law division, all 70 have all taken that training by now. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and from that point, um, sort of phase two was I have developed the um, small working groups with two mentors and then groups of maybe six to seven judges of varying degrees of seniority um, who will be meeting once a month and um, not just and concentrating more on in-depth case management and also mentorship. So it definitely sounds like there's more to come. My final question for you, Your Honor, is, is there anything practitioners we can be doing to shorten the long cause hearings on DVs so they don't suck the life out of the judicial system? I mean, you put some really great practical um, resources in place for us. Very excited to see the civil harassment mediation back. But is there anything that you'd like to see us do to really preserve the courtroom time? Well, that's a question for you, isn't it? Um, I, I do think things can be done, um, but it's not necessarily my place uh, to tell you how to practice law. Um, I have talked about at the last, at our last meeting that I would be happy to uh, engage in some discussion with a group of attorneys um, on this issue and see what we can come up with with some recommendations. Um, as I said, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and if, if the Bar Associations wanna have a meeting and, and start that discussion, I'm more than happy. It's, it's, definitely, it's definitely something that is, has changed, I'll say. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's changed. Well, we welcome the discussion and we appreciate how accessible you are to all of us. Patrick, are you still with us or should I turn, turn over the mic to Alice? I think he's trying to clear out the, oh, there he is. Can you hear me? Yep. Sorry. I, I uh, was uh, logged off, I think, by the LA, uh, uh, LA Wi-Fi guest. <laughs> so, um, I, I, so I was, I've been gone for the last, I don't know, minute or so. Is it my turn? Your timing is impeccable because you're up. It was perfect, huh? Well, the, the question I have, Judge, is um, how are we staffed for judges and commissioners? Well, it, it sort of depends on who you ask. Um, <clears throat> from, from my perspective, we are down at, we are still down a judge. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's, it's even more the issue of trying to get back some courtrooms in mosque. Um, but what's happened is uh, we had a opening in Whittier and very recently uh, the court administration and Judge Taylor informed us that <clears throat> we would be losing a courtroom at, in Compton. Um, they looked at the numbers and they, their view was that um, the numbers didn't justify three bench officers and that the third one was only there temporarily. That was before my time. Um, you know, the bench officers there voiced the same things that we've just talked about, which is we don't have as much numbers, but the bulk of our cases are restraining orders and civil harassment. So, but uh, it is what it is. So one of the bench officers from Compton, uh, Judge Emily Spear, is going to be moving to Whittier. <clears throat> um, there had been an opening there because uh, Judge James Horan had moved to Long Beach. So I might as well go through all of the other changes that we've had recently. 
um, <clears throat> Judge Dean Kitchens uh, is in the AV and uh, he substituted in for Commissioner Nord, who's now at Mosque. I would remind all of you that Commissioner Nord not only practiced family law, but he's been a bench officer in family and probate for seven years. So I hope you give him a chance. I also want to just point out that on a, on a positive note, we, we have more judicial officers who have family law experience than we really ever have before. We've got Judge Scully, Judge Casati, Judge Salcido, Judge Puente Porras, um, Commissioner Aronoff, and Commissioner Durant. Uh, <clears throat> we've also had a change in Van Nuys. Um, Judge Michael Amirian moved over to civil, unfortunately. And we now have a brand new judge, uh, Judge Kia, Gia Kim, who we're very excited about, as we are all of our new judges. Um, judge Bradley Phillips um, substituted in for Judge Swift, who moved over to Santa Monica. And as I mentioned earlier, we have two new um, 1058 commissioners, uh, Commissioner Tiffany Tai and Christine Goulong, um, who are excellent. Right now, they are basically a six on five courtroom, because again, we don't have an extra courtroom for them. Um, so that's, that's really about where we're going. Um, we also have a new bench officer, uh, Judge uh, William Weinberger, and uh, we're going to announce where he's going uh, probably in the next couple of days. Well, I think that the next question, I think you already covered in your, um, in your last answer about upcoming or recent rotations of judicial officers, but um, with the new judges, uh, it seems like they're supposed to get up to speed quickly. We talked about the mentorship. Is part of that mentorship uh, learning case management? Well, um, it depends what very quickly means to you. Uh, when I was assigned to <laughs> family law in 2006, I think, or five, uh, my training was to watch uh, the judge for the afternoon and then start my calendar the next day mm -hmm. <laughs> without any other formal training. So the good news is we're doing a whole lot better. Um, judges get at least two weeks of training. Um, they do get case management. They watch restraining orders. You know, um, it's overwhelming um, to start. And I can, I can tell you this because that was... I had to experience that, but it's overwhelming for folks to start in family law because as we all know, it's a very complex area and it's not just about money or it's not just about custody. So it's a, it's a complex area, but. Is, um, is there any uh, um, input from the bar in terms of the judicial training? Do you ever invite lawyers to speak or anything like that? Uh, no, should I? Well, we are the audience. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, there may be opportunities um, that we could think of to do some joint trainings for um, for new judges. Um, I would certainly be open to that. Um, the other thing that I want to just mention that I'm excited about um, is I've. I'm about to launch the first ever um, statement of decision bank uh, for family law. No, you don't get access to it, but uh, all the judicial officers do. So we have our own secret portal. And um, so I'm really hoping that that will also help uh, newer judicial officers to be able to have more confidence in writing their first statement of decision or reading about reading some complex issues. Um, and I've also, we've revamped um, 
they're the research attorney worksheets. So I've had some judges work on those and we've completely redone those. So that should also help on motions. So I'm, I'm doing, um, I'm trying to do a lot to support the judicial officers so that they can get through their calendars efficiently and have the knowledge that they need. I know those, those um, research attorney worksheets were circulated a while back. I remember seeing them years ago. Are those, uh, are those secret or are those available? Because I think they might help in the drafting of motions so they sort of fit in with the template of how they're reviewed. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. I'll have to find out. Okay. Um, the next question was, um, has the court, what, uh, what has the court experienced in terms of e-filing issues? Uh, well, on some days it's really great. And on other <laughs> days we want to pull our hair out one by one. <coughs> we had one of those in the last few weeks. <laughs> So, you know, we're building the plane as we fly it. Um, I have to say we have an excellent, we have excellent administration, excellent CTS, you know, technology staff, and we're constantly bringing them issues and they're constantly fixing them and changing things. I'll give you an example. Um, I realized my JA, Jackie actually realized that uh, with this new system of called CARES, where we sign, um, sometimes where we sign our orders, sometimes it's appropriate for the JA to use our signature stamp. They used to have just like the stamp. Well, under the current program, they couldn't do it. Um, so we just changed that. So they now have access to our signature stamp electronically as well. Um, I think, uh, I have some other things to say, but we'll, I'll wait till um, about the technology stuff. Yeah, with, with respect to the um, e-filing, if we, if we have a problem, is there a place that we as uh, the filers can go? A uh, phone number. You know, it's so interesting because um, there is a lot of phone numbers. Um, so I'm glad you, you asked that. Uh, let me see, I have a note. I think, I, I think Abbas gave yes, us we a have, phone we, number we in our prep session. Bus. I have it here. If, you, so if you there know. are, if there, here it is. If there are problems with the attorney portal, um, the phone number is 213-383, no, 213-830-0400. Um, and that is, and there's also a site which has, um, also when you go on the attorney portal, um, there are instructions for attorneys. And a lot of questions that have been asked are answerable that way. Um, if there is a problem um, filing something, um, then you can, you know, I, I was very proud of this, that we, uh, we were able to, re, to completely staff with, I think, 16 people now, mm -hmm. live people who will answer your questions about your case. I think it's 213-633-6363. Correct. Um, and um, they are there to help you. Um, if you need to kind of move up the food chain on that, um, there's a email on, if there's a more of a e-filing question, you can also send an email to flefilesupport at lacourt.org. And these that group of people will also help with trouble. <coughs> you know, if there is some problem that's more systemic, that's not getting done, um, contact me and I'll do my best to find the person who can solve it. Judge, um, what specifically is the court doing to uh, implement uh, SB 320, the, the gun 
control uh, legislation? So we are currently in compliance with SB 320. Um, what SB 320 does is it provides that if there is a violation, uh, then what we uh, then we need to inform uh, law enforcement as well as uh, the district attorney. So we have a specific district attorney person that we inform. Um, there's still a lot of confusion um, about the implementation. Um, I have sent out scripts to judges. Um, we're looking at maybe revamping some of those as we've seen, you know, as, as we've seen some glitches. Um, I'm, I'm talking to people statewide about the issue. Um, uh, San Diego, for example, have come up with some of their own forms that are really helpful. And so I'm gonna be looking at maybe adopting some of those forms myself. Um, and I have a, a further meeting set up with the uh, gun control folks and the DAs, I think it's in the middle of August. So it's happening. Everybody knows about it. Everybody has cheat sheets. Everybody has um, uh, uh, scripts. Um, well, you know we're it's it's we're still we're still working it out alexandra okay so uh the, some of the other questions that came in um is i i think you covered most of it there's now that we're doing e-filings are there any procedural changes in the courtrooms or in the court itself um there's no really procedural changes besides the rollout, um, you know, of of the more extensive LACC with the breakout rooms and things like that. Um, are people really, actually using that? Yeah, right. yeah, they are. Um, there has been a couple of issues. There was a couple of questions. Um, in particular, there was a question about the join now button that sometimes it doesn't turn green. Um, that was the first time I heard it. Um, I will tell people that they need to toggle to the right tab or else they're not going to see it. Um, the other thing I would tell people is you can use the broadcast function so that you can hear what's going on. So if there is some problem with the join now, you'll hear your case being called. Now, if you're on your phone right now, the broadcast, that broadcast function at this time doesn't work. So I don't recommend um, you being on your phone and trying to do that if, if that is a problem. Um, I haven't heard that there's a problem, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's still, but again, we'll, uh, we continue to work things out. Is it perfect? Of course not. Um, but I think we're all getting used to it. Um, I will tell you, and I think most of my colleagues agree that <clears throat> making sure that your video works is uh, of utmost importance because it is extremely hard to conduct court hearings when people can't see each other and everybody wants to talk at the same time. So um, I, you know, make sure that if you want to appear remotely, that's totally fine. Um, if your clients are there, totally fine. But um, have your video working. Um, don't be in your car. It's not like you're chatting with your friend in the car. Um, tell your clients to be appropriate and you know treat it with the respect of a court hearing. By the way, do judges <clears throat> prefer in-person or video 
calls or video. I, hear I can't. Video. I can't answer that. Um, How about you? You know, it depends. Um, it really depends. I'll tell you if I think we need to be in person. Otherwise, we can just expect that we can do it uh, on video. <clears throat> if I can, now, in, if I can interject there, Judge, um, what's the policy in mosque about masking is there anything on the horizon there no it's on there now <laughs> i just got a notice so alice you want to tell us what the program protocol yeah i is? went to, i went to uh i was pro tem on um what day is this this week and i got a notice uh a day or two before that the court now expects everyone to mask but interestingly enough well, I go in there and I mask up. I look all over the courthouse and it says masks are recommended. So I think somebody didn't get the notice or maybe I got the notice too early. I don't know. Well, I, I, I have been out of the country so I'm a little bit behind, but um, I think they're starting indoor mask requirements again in Los Angeles. Well, here, here's, um, I'm in the courthouse now, unfortunately, because um, I got stuck, but uh, what I heard, because I, I saw people coming in with masks and without masks, is the employees of the court are required to wear a mask. Uh, the lawyers and litigants are not yet required. Right. That's why I was thinking if you, something's in the wind on that or not. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know that, you know, everything, everything changes by the minute. Um, <clears throat> Um, everything changes by the minute. Uh, I would highly recommend masks. Um, the Moss Courthouse has been pretty much a Petri dish. Mm -hmm. and there were a lot of positive folks. I will say to those people who are listening, <clears throat> because I have the experience of both being on the bench and on the in the bar, is that when I'm sitting on the bench and I have to be masked and the witnesses and the litigants have to be masked, it is horrendous to be able to get the information out of them, especially if you have um, a Spanish interpreter or other language interpreter and they're trying to talk and you're trying to talk. So to that extent, if you can possibly have your hearing on video, I would recommend that you do that because it is greatly helpful to judicial officer. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And and you too can sit on the bench if you volunteer for the JPT <laughs> program. <laughs> okay, I have some more questions for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Are there, uh, I understand from our discussions uh, before we did this program, is the judges are now e-signing their proposed orders and their judgments, is that correct? That's correct. And now on the judgments, how do we get the judgment? We used to have, we would submit uh, the judgment and we would submit the notice of entry of judgment, would have the addresses, would have two stamped envelopes, and the court then sent it to them. What happens in this process now? Well, um, if, if you're submitting a judgment as an attorney, um, then a conformed copy will be emailed back to you, and then um, as well as what, what is statutorily required that the entry of judgment will be mailed or e emailed to all of the mm -hmm. parties. So if you're the submitting party, you'll receive the conformed copy and then it's your obligation to serve. Okay, so it's not gonna be the court anymore <clears throat> necessarily. So you're not going to get a hard piece of paper back. We're not, we're not using um, envelopes. See this piece of paper? It helps. <laughs> hmm. 
Um, okay. there, was, there was some uh, also some questions, I think, about rejections of judgments. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and um, it does appear that when you submit a judgment, you pay, I guess it's like the $15 filing fee through your, um, your service. And uh, you get a notice that says it's received. And then within hopefully 60 days, and I will also tell you that we have more funding um, to expand the judgment unit. So um, the judgment should have a much quicker turnaround in the next six months. So I'm excited about that. Um, if the judgment is defective, it will be returned to you and you do have to resubmit and you uh oh, and you do have to um, pay another, I think, fifteen dollars. So that that is true. I wasn't sure if that was true. I don't know if that helps anybody. Okay, um, that, that was one of the questions. <clears throat> another question they had was, uh, can we be transferred in real time from one courtroom to another? for purposes of remote appearance. In other words, we appear in one courtroom, the, the court, either the judge recuses herself or himself or whatever it may be. Do we then get transferred to another, uh, another courtroom right away? Or do we have to log in again? Or do we have to get another date? What's the procedure? No, you can be directly sent to another courtroom. Um, the JA has a program called Stream Right. And, um, they hook on to that program and then send you another link, email you another link that you can just click on. I think most of you have done it already, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, one more thing, 170.6s. What happens to them? You file, I guess you don't file that online, you file that in paper and then what happens? Um, Actually, it's the same as it's always been because they are exempt from the e-filing. Um, now that we've had a couple of hiccups where people file them when they're not supposed to and then they get lost and then there's a problem, um, but uh, they are not to be e-filed. Um, they are filed in the court that, um, that, that the 170 is being filed against. And once the judge approves it, it gets, um, the JA has, uh, through their program, Odyssey, um, they have essentially a wheel to send it elsewhere. And they will notify you where it's sent. And then you have an opportunity, the other side, <clears throat> that has an opportunity subsequently within a 10-day period to file their 170.6? They do. They do. Yes, now, I will, I will mention, um, I'm sorry, I, I will mention that um, I think during um, Judge Riff's uh, time, he was allowing um, a, essentially a third 170 when you were sent to long cause. Um, I, I looked at that and um, uh, I don't believe it statutorily appropriate. So um, once you burn your 170, you burned it. Yeah, okay. so, something I learned in our prep, uh, you, you made reference to it, but just to clarify is I thought that you were in charge of reassigning, but actually it's done now with a computer. Yes, and it has been for a long time. So if you think people, people are getting back at you, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> all right now a few more cases on um a few more questions rather when we are <clears throat> uh set for a date in department two from a branch court should we expect that the setting will be treated as a tsc or something else 
Um, so yes, it should be treated as usually. So I think what, what you're referring to is a situation where a case is being sent for long cause, then it should be treated as a TSC. Um, there are certain situations where, let's say a restraining order uh, can't be finished or is too long, especially from one of the restraining order courts. Um, and they can't they can't handle a three hour or four hour, and that gets sent. Uh, if there's no time waiver, that'll have to be dealt with immediately, obviously. Um, but if it's sent for long cause, um, then the next hearing, which is usually within a week, um, um, will be a TSC. Why is that? Yeah, because. Uh, I, I like to have time to review the file and um, see if I think it's ready for to be sent out, um, if there's any possibility of settlement um, and to make sure that people really understand what trial is gonna look like and how much it's gonna cost, et cetera, et cetera. So I generally um, have those cases uh, in front of me within a week. If people need it sooner, they can ask. Um, but what I have found is most cases uh, announce ready and really aren't ready. So well, what is uh, the sorry I'm to sorry. jump on this, but a question of clarity on that. In some of the branch courts, the dates we're being given for department two are seven or eight months out. And we're being told this may be a trial setting conference. It may, you may, we're not sure what you're doing. So go to department two and be ready to start that date or department two will tell you what to do. Um, is, is that a different animal than what you just described? Uh, yes. I haven't, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't met that animal um, and wasn't aware of that. Uh, uh, that concerns me. Um, so that, that shouldn't happen. And um, you can let me know which courts that's happening. What should, what should happen is uh, the JA in that court should call Jackie and it should get on our calendar within a week. Thank you. So can I ask about how the procedure is going with this TSC? Let's say <clears throat> we get sent down by the home court to department two, go to your trial setting conference. A week later, we, <clears throat> we, are, we appear at the trial setting conference. At that point, you go over the case or whatever, and you assign a mandatory settlement conference about how long before the trial date. If, it, all if you do, it, it, it all depends. It all depends. Some cases have already done mandatory. You know, some have already done it. Um, some need more massaging. Um, some are not ready. It really all depends. If 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 there's nothing left to do, and um, this is truly a case that needs to be litigated, then it gets sent out that day. It gets sent a, out. Sent for out trial? No. So. Um, that was a change also whereby um, we, we are not in control of the dedicated trial court's calendars. They're in control. So I can't say you're set for Judge Hansel October 1, October 2, October 3. So I send you, I tell you to contact Judge Hansel, set up a status conference, and then Judge Hansel will tell you when he's available. So the question then is <clears throat> procedure wise, you have the trial, let's say uh, you get sent out from department, I don't know who, to you as to department two for a trial setting conference, you've decided that it is ready to go to trial and you then send it to let's say Judge Hansel, and the, and it is sent that morning on on video or uh, whatever a method there is to Judge Hansel, and then there is a discussion sometime or another with Judge Hansel, 
as to when the when the trial how is this working sort of um so most cases i will say you know the two of you call over to judge hansel if he's available he might take you if not he'll give you uh, a, a status conference date ah, okay so it's, <clears throat> it's dependent on each judge really and and we're assuming that on these long cause cases by the time they get assigned to uh, the long cause uh, trial, a mandatory settlement conference will have taken place at least, what, three weeks before? I would hope so. Okay, but you're the one that assigns it. Yes. Oh, okay. well, uh, sometimes, but sometimes it can be assigned through the uh, home court, mm -hmm. the mandatory settlement conferences, um, or they can call down to, to, to and get, uh, and get and get a date. Um, you know, when we're talking about long cause, um, it is my view that uh, we need to continue to work on early intervention programs. Um, and that's something that I'm extremely interested in. Uh, I can tell you that um, I'm gonna be doing a pilot starting probably, I think we said starting October. I haven't announced it yet on uh, where one court, one of our DTCs, uh, more senior DTCs is gonna be spending some time doing uh, an early intervention court. I think it's gonna be once a week on more complex cases. We're still, work we're still ironing some things out. And also Judge Kaufman and I are talking about her doing um, a different kind of intervention uh, where she's potentially gonna have a bunch of different cases going at the same time, um, perhaps one day a week. So we're, we're really looking at a lot of options um, to try to move cases appropriately along um, and help folks to figure out the things they can figure out um, so they don't have to wait a long time because the trial dates are few and far. And um, as we talked about in the beginning of this program, and I have mentioned to you many times, the restraining orders are still taking up, you know, 40 to 60% of the time and uh, of the dedicated trial courts. So, <clears throat> um, they're obviously mandatorily, they get heard first, then custody, then property. So if you've got a property case that needs to be heard, don't hold your breath. Go to a private judge. I didn't say that. I just... <laughs> uh, does, does civil harassment have the same priority as the domestic, uh, the domestic violence? Yes. yes. I do. And, and for those of us who have been working as pro tems, we work in, uh, in courtrooms that have DVs and uh, CHs, civil harassments, and they are multitude and they take up the same amount of time, both, both of those types of, and plus elder abuse and all of those others. And right. there are a myriad, there are like 20 plus cases on calendar every single day. Right, I'm not even, I haven't even mentioned the workplace violence cases. That's right. Um, uh, elder abuse cases, mm -hmm. gun violence cases. Why we have all of those cases, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, and again, as I've said, I've uh, been speaking about it to our leadership. Um, it's not the most popular thing that I talk about with them, but uh, I'm, that's never stopped me, so. Okay, I have one more question before I hand this over to Kendra. Uh, <clears throat> are there any plans to add a feature in the eternal portal for law firms so that multiple attorneys in the law firm can access one account? Because right now, it's only dedicated one attorney and end the discussion. Well, guess well maybe what? that's not in your... <laughs> well, it's not necessarily something that I would have known about, but the beauty of this program 
is that I looked into it. I learned all kinds of things uh, that I had no idea. Um, so it turns out actually you can already do that. You can designate multiple lawyers in your firm. You just have to add them uh, and their emails. So. Okay. So Kendra, your turn. So your honor, I have um, a question that may test your, your knowledge of documents to be e-filed. And I'm not sure I expect you to know the answer to this. So if you don't know, not, not a problem. I'm happy to look it up and respond to um, the individual who reached out to me. But you mentioned the 170.6 was not appropriately e-filed. The question has come up, what about the child case registry form? Many times we've been told not necessarily to file that, but to lodge that. Is that mm. document appropriately e-filed? Uh, well, what I said was that the 170.6 is an exception to the e-filing rule. Correct. Um, you're asking if the child registry form, what, yes. what are you referring to exactly? Sure, that is the, the form that generally after the support order is made contains all of the confidential information regarding the parents their social security numbers, their driver's license number. It helps with the SDU components. So generally what we did in the past was we didn't actually file it, but more so submitted it for more lodging in the file. Um, it's an interesting query that just hit my inbox. And again, I realize I'm kind of blindsiding you with it. So if this is a discussion you'd like to have with me offline, I'm happy to reach back out to the individuals who posed it and sure. get them an answer offline. I'm, I'm, hap I'm happy to answer it. My, I don't know the answer. And you know, as, we, as I often used to tell witnesses, don't guess if you don't know. Um, so I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Uh, my logical mind would tell me it's not filed because we really don't want to see people's social security numbers. And since it's not specifically designated as accepted, but this is what I love about you doing this program. I appreciate that when you say you're going to put in the time, you absolutely are going to put in the moments with me to get to the bottom of this. And I just don't think that everyone realizes how hard you work to get us these answers and how much time outside of your office time you devote to bring preparing and bringing us a program like this. And for that, we thank you. I second that. <laughs> well, I think, I think all of you, I think we're, are we running out of, are we run out of time today? Yeah, but um, this is. But I, is there any other last minute questions? I, I had a question about the uh, exhibits. Um, if we have a minute. Uh, yeah. It's been my understanding and the judicial assistants have reinforced this. There's some rule that you have to have paper exhibits for the trial, right? So they can mark them and all that. I look for the rule and the rules aren't clear, but it makes it sound like you can do exhibits electronically. Every judge seems to have their own idea about how the exhibits are supposed to be. Is it is it just the individual judge or is there some policy? I know one of the things that I've been uh, chastise about some judges, not all, don't bring them on a dit, uh, don't bring them on a thumb drive because it may corrupt their system and they've right. been told not to use the thumb drives. Um, I've used the iPad, the iPad or the Surface, uh, those have worked great. Is there some way we can get rid of all this paper? I know Alice likes it because she even has a roll. Are you kidding me just because I'm ancient? <laughs> Look at the Rolodex there. But is there some way we can just do That's the whole right. thing That's right. My, Rolodex, my trusted Rolodex has more stuff than any of you on your computers. And I can reach it easily. <clears throat> well, more power to you. Um, uh, so um, exhibits are exempt from e-filing. Uh, there is no rule that says you have to provide a paper, anything. Um, uh, if you ask your younger colleagues, 
I would say under 30, maybe 35. They have no idea what a thumb drive is. Um, <laughs> or what a Rolodex is. <laughs> uh, or a Rolodex or a Telex. <laughs> um, but, uh, or a mimeograph machine. <laughs> I'm dating myself here. Um, so it really is up to the judge. I mean, a lot of the lawyers are doing a fantastic job um, with learning how to present complicated documents with providing iPads and things like that. Um, There's some great programs out there. So I would really recommend that you do that. Um, I find it really helpful personally. So in defense of my old age, I want everyone to know that I was one of the maybe second or third attorneys ever to use iPad for exhibits. And we didn't give a thumb drive to the judge. We gave an iPad to the judge and iPad to, to counsel and iPad to the witness. And then we had uh, for, for impeachment exhibits, we transferred in the middle of the hearing from our iPad to the, that of the judge and to the witness and to opposing counsel, it went real smoothly. And the only paper that we had was a, what is required by law, which is to give uh, the paper a copy of all the exhibits to the clerk. And that was many years ago. It was almost at the beginning, almost, and it was in front of um, Judge Lewis. And it was, I don't know how many day trial weeks of it. And so, uh, darlings, I'm not as old as I look. Well, we, we, we thank you on behalf of the environment. <laughs> I just was, um, Your Honor, I just came late. First of all, I want to say, I apologize. I was another Zoom that you know. And um, on behalf of LACPA Family Law Section, our member, thank you very much, Your Honor, for doing this. It's a, a pleasure to have you and just answer these questions. And do you want to do you want to mention um, your fabulous program on Saturday? Yes, if I if I may, we have the 10th an, annual seminar on on cultural competency, which, to my knowledge, all of you five of you will be participating, except for Alexandra that just uh, has a day off. Uh, <laughs> we are the Sabbath, uh, darling. Sabbath. <laughs> I invite everybody to participate and. Um, it is for free for all of participants, so uh, please be part of that. And thank you, Honor, for re remembering. And we'll see you day after tomorrow. Okay. Um, I think that somebody's playing music. I don't know. I think that covers um, what we have. Again, um, I would invite everyone to uh, reach out to the bar associations, if there's a burning question that you have, um, as, as Kendra mentioned, um, I'm, I try to be very accessible and um, get back to you on any and all questions. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. And I uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. Take care.